Here's to you, dear listeners, and welcome to another episode of Metal Gear Mondays, the most thorough Metal Gear podcast on the internet. I am your host, Sam Ray, and listen, y'all, we got another one. We threw the line out, reeled it back in, and we 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 pulled a Christopher Randolph out of the ocean. <laughs> but before we get into that, I'm joined by some special people, of course, Alessio Summerfield. Hey, what's going on? I am a fisher of men. And I caught a Christopher <laughs> Randolph. <laughs> and um, and we are uh, joined by also special correspondent, um, Otacon super fan, Miss Alice Chang. <laughs> Hi, I, uh, <laughs> Otacon's definitely like the favorite Pokemon to catch, I guess. Yep. So. Yep. Otacon's the best boy, I think. And this this interview just solidified it even more. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, Christopher Randolph is a delight to talk to. I, I don't think that we've uh, we've not been delighted to talk to anyone. So this introduction is going to be about the same every time. But there's something special that we got to talk to Otacon. Because yeah. aside from that weird little stretch with James, we are on record as being humongous fans of Otacon. Sweet baby angel Otacon. Um. Uh, yeah, I can't believe you. I can't believe you told him that we've called him that. <laughs> it was why not? Not to laugh so bad. Why not? <laughs> um, <laughs> I just, no, it was great. <laughs> I don't know. I Wait. feel like I like wooed you guys into loving Otacon more. Oh, I think Christopher, yeah. Christopher Randolph wooed me into liking Otacon. Yeah. More. <laughs> I had a very high opinion of Otacon to begin with, but I do think that talking to you, um. It has has continued to elevate him in my mind. He is he is a beautiful beautiful boy. It's a, it's a oh, boy. we didn't ask we didn't ask one question that I really wanted to ask. What's that? Has he ever done the Solid Snake Otacon handshake with David Hayter? Oh, oh my god, I was gonna man. ask that at the end, and I forgot too. Fuck, I well, wanted to ask that, that we'll too. Just, yeah, we'll just uh, well Alessio, just ask him when you go get coffee with him in New York. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> also uh, my head canon is that yes, they did that in the booth. Yeah, <laughs> during the recording. Yeah, you can do it's it with practice. him, and I'll record it. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. that'd be beautiful. Live action. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, w- with that, with that being said, um, we we talked to Otacon. So before before we um, jump into that, we have to do our thing. But first thing. Um, you can you can follow Mr. Christopher Randolph on the internet. Um, he is on Twitter. It's at Christoph Ran C H R I S T O P H R A N. Um, pro follow that Christopher Randolph on there. Um, Alessia, where can they find you on the internet? You can find me at AC Summerfield, um, acsummerfield.com. Um, I'm going to be overhauling my website and some other stuff as I uh, get further along with um, Are You All Right production, which is my short film that I just concluded. Um, and I'm going to have to do that stuff anyway because I got to prep to shop myself around to the TV world in New York. So, um, yeah, that's where you can find me. And, and Alice, where can they find you on the Internet? I'm on Instagram at at titwillow, no W. Yeah. Did you say um, titwillow, no W? Oh, no, no w, w at the end. end. Yeah. I, was like, yeah. I was like, no W in the middle? What do you no. mean? W at the end. There's no W at the end. No there w is the, the end. W in the middle confirmed. <laughs> you can find me at World Wide Web, no Ws. <laughs> <laughs> and I will also uh, I will also vouch um, Alice is also a pro follow. She is a tremendous photographer. So you would be Aww. you would be remiss if you did not follow her on the Instagram. So check her out. <laughs> And come um, shoot with me. I'm in Philly. I like to come to LA though. Come find me and let's shoot. I'll yeah, give she you bounces a discount all over rate. the place. Yeah, Metal Gear Monday's good. discount code. Yeah, discount code M- <laughs> discount code MGM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is our official is our official sponsor our first official sponsorship. Yeah. <laughs> our first official Yay. discount code. <laughs> Did I just break a rule by serving that out there? <laughs> no. no okay. really Perfect. Sam, I misheard you. Instead of vouch, I thought you said vouch. And I was like, what's a vouch? I don't like that. You don't want to know. Anyway, (laughs) you can find me on Twitter (laughs) at Sanjul. That's S-A-N-J-U-U-L. I tweet things there. Um, 
And I really would like somebody to talk to me about the um, <sighs> the statute of limit. I tweeted this the other day. I want to know what the statute of limitations for tweeting things that um, I thought were funny but didn't have an audience um, and just reusing those jokes on Twitter. So if anybody can like shoot me a just like an estimated time frame. I've been on Twitter for 10 years. So there's a lot of like content there that we can dig up. So just let me know. Um, <laughs> I'd appreciate it at Sandal. Um, and Sam, yeah, where can people find the show? I, I see we did it out of order this time. I completely forgot. You can go to metalgearmondays.com. That's where we hold all of our content links to everything you could possibly want. But we're also on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash metalgearmondays where as little as a dollar will get you sweet, sick goodies. Um, Patreon, or not Patreon, we have a Discord server. We have um, a completely additional podcast. We have video content. Um, so check that out. Um, you can also find us on YouTube, um, youtube.com slash Metal Gear Mondays. We're going to start uploading um, uh, Let's Plays and stuff there within the coming months. Um, so that's going to be really cool. Um, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Pizza Hut, uh, Red Robin, that Red Robin, no. that toast, that toaster on the side of the highway that you saw for some reason is very strange. Uh, you can find us in a lot of places. Um, yeah, Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, um, podcatchers, the world over. You can find us um, in those places, and please, please, if you feel inclined, leave us reviews in those places if they allow reviews. Um, no, iTunes does. Leave us an iTunes review. That'd be super cool. Um, and yeah. I think that's about it. We have an Instagram. We have a store, bit.ly slash MGM store. So there's a lot of places you could go. Yeah, Sam designs all those t-shirts. I own one of them. They're great. I also own do one that. of them. I own a, that. It's just a box t-shirt now. Yeah, I have a sticker of Isaac that just says fumbling in the dark with Isaac when I'm <laughs> stuck onto my refrigerator. So. <laughs> Is that? Are you taking that refrigerator with you or are you going to have to find a way to peel that off of there? Uh, well, I didn't stick it on. I magnetized it on. That's a uh, better idea. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm leaving my appliances. If anybody's in the market for a house in St. Louis, hit hit your boy up. <laughs> Discount code MG. <laughs> yeah. Discount code. We'll t- we'll shave thirty five dollars oh off this awesome. hundred and fifty thousand dollar house. That's amazing. That'd be um, amazing. Yeah, but yeah. So I think that's about it. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to say before we go into our interview with Christopher Randall? I want to say one thing real quick, Alice. Uh-huh. Welcome to your first interview episode. Yeah. I loved having you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I was so nervous because I'm hella in love with Otacon. So, mm. yeah. Same, same. <laughs> I'll fight you for him. Wow. I don't, I don't know if I, I don't want to fight. Would Otacon fight? Can, can love really blossom on the podcast field? Why didn't we <laughs> ask him that? I wanted to ask him if love could really bloom on a battlefield. Well, that's snap. amazing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we should just dive into it. Let's do it. Okay. Look out, Snake! The guys who stole my stealth prototypes are in there with you! So, um, yeah, so, Christopher, thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, thank you for being on the show. My pleasure. I'm very happy to be here. Very nice. Um, I, I, I kind of want to get us started with in, this interesting tidbit that I that I found. Um I know that a majority of the folks that we've spoken to, um, Cam Clark, David Hader, um, a lot of these folks are all West Coast based. Right. But I noticed that you're very much so an East Coast guy. Can you tell me a little bit about how how like were you in LA for Metal Gear? Have you always yeah, been? Yeah, no, Coast? I uh, I I was living in Los Angeles during most of the '90s, and uh, I had I kind of stumbled into the metal gear universe because i i had actually taken a an animation acting class uh because you know in the sort of mid to late 90s it, that was what voice acting was about really it was much more animation than than the whole i mean the whole computer game thing just kind of exploded just a little later after that um so uh, and the 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 class was taught in part anyway by Chris Zimmerman Salter. Um so uh so and it had been recommended to me uh, interestingly by Jennifer Hale who I'm sure you guys know uh or know of um yeah. who I was in a I was in a normal acting class with. 
uh, and Jennifer and I were chatting and she said she was doing, she was doing VO for Dell, I think at the time and was like, you know, you should, you should take this class. Chris, Chris Zimmerman's really wonderful. And uh, so I went and took the class and I really enjoyed it. Um, it was also taught by a guy named Charlie Adler, who does a lot of uh, animation voice, um, all sorts of goofy, goofy characters. Cow and chicken. He's he plays. Oh both, yeah, he, yeah. He plays both cow and chicken and the devil in. <laughs> so, oh, that will give you a sense of how crazy he was. Uh, so that was great, and then maybe. I think less than six months after that class ended, Chris called me up and said, you know, I'm casting this weird game thing and none of us really know what it is, but do you want to come in and audition? Uh, and I said, sure. Um, so that's that's kind of how I stumbled into it. And then I, I remained in LA until eh, I came back to New York about the end of 2000. Um, and they, I think because, you know, obviously the first game was such a hit um, and the character was such a big deal that they they asked me back and uh, we, over the years, worked out, you know, most of the recording is done in L.A. So we worked out my getting back there and um, and all of that. So you did travel back and forth? You didn't do it? At I all did. Up? No, no, I did. Well... Uh, mostly I traveled back and forth. And uh, I think, honestly, at first, I think, I, you know, I'm trying to remember, I think for, for Metal Gear 2, I think I actually paid my own way. But I had so many friends in LA uh, that, it, you know, I could go back, I had places to stay for free. And I, you know, was able to visit with friends and stuff and also do the recording sessions, um, which I was definitely paid for. But um, and then after that, we began, we negotiated travel into the deal for, for the rest of the games. Um, occasionally, we would do a remote from New York. Uh, we did two or three of those. But usually it was kind of stuff we were just picking up, you know, uh, mm -hmm. so we, we, it could be done quickly. It's, it's easier to be in the same room. Um, it's easier for Chris and it's sort of easier for me to, um, and for, for the actor because you, your voice director is really, really important. And you, you just, you just have a more direct connection with them and what's going on. If you you can see them through the glass window, you know? Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I know um, Sam and I um, actually got to uh, meet uh, David Hayter and Cam Clark uh, in the flash. Oh yeah. Um, uh, fairly recently and I know we attended some of their panels and David mm -hmm. and Cam were both very uh, even though I guess in the modern digital age it's easy to kind of do uh, remote uh, work um, they were very adamant about like the magic happening in the studio and so that's why I wanted to ask yeah. what it was like to kind of be on a different coast and still work on Metal Gear yeah no I, you know m most of the time I would travel um, and, you know, it's interesting, I, I, and maybe maybe David and Cam brought this up, but uh, the, the other thing that, about recording these things, and very often you're alone in the booth and you're recording, you're recording your parts to parts that have already been recorded by someone else, or in fact, I'm acting with Chris reading the lines to me, you know. But uh, in my opinion, the, the, some of the best uh, scenes in Metal Gear were when the actors were all in the room together. Uh, and you can't, you know, the, I think early on, David and I did a lot in the booth together and Jennifer and I have play, played some love scenes <laughs> in the <laughs> booth together. And, uh, it, 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 there is something about really genuinely playing off of each other that brings more life to, to the work, I think. So, um, it's a pity they can't do that all the time. Yeah. Cause we, cause we've heard a right. lot of stories about how, how everybody being together is more common in like cartoon and animation yeah. as opposed to video games. And so metal gear yeah. was one of the first kind of experiences like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, metal gear, if you think about it, really metal gear was one of the first experiences that involved, you know, 
characters um, in the in the sort of modern computer game era, you know. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this from your other guests in the past, but, you know, when we did the first game, we were just doing the English version of the Japanese game that had already been recorded. Um, and then after that, we, we were actually, they were actually wrapping the game around our voices, which was a, a different process, you know. What was that evolution like? Well, uh, interesting the 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 technological evolution was actually really interesting to chart because of course i'm sure you've all heard the story about the you know the beat up studio where yeah. we recorded the first, you know, <laughs> where, where the truck would go by and we'd have to stop and uh and there was no glass between us and the, the technicians and um so everybody had to be really really quiet um but uh you know i remember metal gear 2 suddenly suddenly they there was a, a an algorithm i guess where they they recorded all of us saying a series of words and they could plug that into the computer and based on that then the animated character's mouth would move depend to our voice depending on whatever we said which was a whole, that was a whole new advancement. Um, and now, of course, it's all motion capture, you know, or, or fa facial capture. Um, so they're literally filming you. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's looking realer and realer. And, the, um, you know, it's, it's, just, it's a different challenge for the actors each time, I think. Right. When you uh, you recently worked on Red Dead Redemption Two specifically doing yeah. motion capture stuff, how different is that from the house in Hollywood with the dump truck oh, outside? Man. I can't even tell you, you know, and and uh, you know, Rockstar's New York base is, um, you know, they have a huge three floor warehouse down in you know in Lower Manhattan with with I think they have seemed like anyway they had four or five you know, sound booths, but then they also out on Long Island have this, you know, extra large basketball court sized motion capture studio. Um, so that was, that was interesting. And I, I really only did a little bit of motion capture for them because, because it was such a long project. Um, and I wasn't, I was not playing a major role in that. Um, but they, they, I went out and did a day of motion capture, and then like a year and a half later, they tried to get me back for more motion capture, and I had, <laughs> I had just oh, had wow. a hip replacement. Um, <laughs> so I was like, I was, I was, I told the agent, look, I can't, I can't guarantee that I can do what they want me to do because I'm not at full physical strength. Um, I am now, but I, you know, at the time I wasn't. So what they wound up doing was getting someone else to do the motion capture. And then they brought me in uh, later that year for a, a really long and intense voice session. Oh, um, okay. Uh, so some of my voice matched my motion capture and some of it matched somebody else's motion capture. <laughs> so what, well, so you, so you grew up on the East coast, correct? Yeah. So, what what kind of, what was your, your family background like when you when you were were growing up and when you decided to break into the industry? What how did your family react to to that? Um, you know, I um, I'm the oldest of five kids, and we grew up in suburban Boston. Uh, my dad's a doctor; he's retired now, um, and we went to a, a really I anyway, and my siblings too went to a you know a really good kind of um, private elementary school that had a really brilliant uh, theater director. I mean, she was also an English teacher, but uh, she was just superb at kind of teaching young youngsters uh, <laughs> about stage acting, you know. And I got really, really hooked on it in very early on, you know, fifth grade, basically. Um, 
and then you know wound up being in all the school plays through ninth grade and then i went off to boarding school uh for uh, 10th 11th 12th and and did a just a ton of theater at where i was there um so i was i was hooked on it early on and it was uh, always what i was going to do in my own head um so that was how that started. And actually, uh, my parents were very supportive, um, surprisingly so. Uh, and, you know, I think <laughs> I, I influenced because my sister is uh, my younger sister is a superb actor uh, who went wow. to Juilliard and uh, does a lot of theater and has been in movies and uh, a bunch of other things. Um, she's based in Western Massachusetts in the Berkshires. Um, but, uh, and my, you know, and then, and it went from there. My younger brother is a rock and roll musician. Um, so it's wow. kind of, you know, I think to some degree, my parents have always gone, where did we go wrong? Um, <laughs> uh, cause none of us has a really a normal job, but, um, so it, you know, it was that it was the, the enjoyment of the art, uh, was how it started. And then, uh, I got. I didn't major in it in undergraduate college. I just got a general education, uh, which was frustrating to me at the time. But but I uh, wound up being very happy about it, particularly when I started directing about ten years ago, where the the uh, sort of ways of thinking and learning how to analyze literature and stuff like that would it, it came in really handy. And I also write, um, so that was very valuable. So undergrad, I just got an English degree, and then I went to graduate school and got a master's degree at uh, UCSD. They have a, a superb professional actor training program in, down in San Diego. So I did three years there with, and got a master's and then moved to New York. And it was always theater and film and television uh, was, was always the goal. The whole voice acting thing was... Uh, I had never even heard of it until, you know, the late nineties. That's awesome. Uh, Christopher, have you, you, you've also been a teacher, right? Yeah, I have taught, I have taught a little bit. I've taught and coached. Um, I'm not doing that now, but I, I would like to get back into that again. I, I enjoy that. Um, I enjoy that. And, and I find, I find when I've been directing theater, which I, I, I've been doing, a fair amount, as I say, over the last nine or 10 years. Um, often I'm, it's sort of a, a way of disguising teaching <laughs> uh, in, terms of, in terms of acting. And, and I'm a firm believer that actually the best way to learn about acting is to put on a play, you know, mm -hmm. um, studio work is great, but, but uh, to put on a play or, or also to make a movie, you know, which now you can do on your phone. Um, so yeah, I, I do teach and occasionally I'll private coach and I do script consulting, which I, you know, a bunch of people sending me plays and film scripts to sort of offer my, my two cents about it. So, That's yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, I, I know before Metal Gear, clearly, um, you, you had a little bit of a career sort of doing on-screen roles, obviously. Um, you were in like Doogie Howser and News yeah. Radio and Mad yeah, About yeah. You. Yeah. Uh, I, the, the interesting thing is just kind of charting the, um, and we always end up going down a, a deep hole kind of sure. looking at everybody's career, um, kind of charting the dates and like the years that you were active. It seemed like, I don't know. It seemed like there there was sort of like a gap of time between those and then Metal Gear. And obviously you were taking classes and stuff, but were, were you working on things in between? Uh, maybe... You know, what I was doing is theater, which is is kind of doesn't probably doesn't show up in your research. Uh, you know, I mean, I when I got out of grad school, I immediately moved to New York City. And uh, and began to try and sort of work my way into the industry there, and uh, I did, you know, wound up doing a lot of theater, mostly regional theater, where you get hired in New York City, and then you go to St. Louis or Rochester or wherever, and you live for three months or something like that, and you rehearse and put on a show, and then you go back home to New York and start all over again. 
Um, a lot of actors do this, uh, and and you know you can make a good living at it. And sometimes that it can lead you know can lead to other things. If you kind of there are some theaters that sometimes will do production that will feed into New York and the commercial theater, and uh, that can be really advantageous. But it it's a great way to get experience and to do what you love doing. Um, so I was in New York till about 91, 92, and I decided to give LA a try. I really didn't have a whole lot of connections out there. I had a few, but not a lot. Um, so I just kind of picked up and moved out there, which is looking back on it, kind of outrageous and may have been a mistake career wise on some levels. Um, <clears throat> but I, I did it and I, you know, sort of plumbed the connections I could find and managed to kind of get those little roles that you mentioned here and there. Um, but the fact is, I, you know, what I really wanted to do was film and television. And I, and the whole reason of, for going out to LA was that. And uh, I really honestly had a lot of trouble um, setting up the kind of support system you need in order to do that in LA. You, you, you got to have an agent who's supporting you, probably a manager too. Um, and you, you know, they have to really work for you because you, you can't really get in the door on your own in Los Angeles. It's different in New York. You, you can do a lot on your own in New York. I found LA very difficult for that sort of mm. thing. So I'm happy to hear I, that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Cons you know, considering, considering where I'm going. And, and what I was doing, you know, instead was doing theater. Uh, in LA with, with the thought that, you know, maybe someone would come and see and then, you know, recognize my brilliance <laughs> and, uh, and help, me, help me get on TV. Um, and so I did a, a lot of theater during those years in the 90s that um, some of which was just God awful. And some of, it, <laughs> some of it was really, really good, I have to say. And, uh, and had it been anywhere else than LA, it might have really made a difference. But Los Angeles has a ton of theater and it nobody really cares about it that much. I, I don't <laughs> do, no, I mean, I, I, and I, I have to be cautious about that. I don't mean to slam LA or the theater because there's very good theater that goes on in LA. Uh, but my, what I discovered, at least for me in my experience is that very often the theater in LA is um, a bunch of people hoping to get seen so they can get into film and television, which is absolutely reasonable and understandable. But it, it, it it's, you know, it, it just creates a different vibe around the project you're doing. And, um, and then other theater is often a vehicle for people who are already in film and television to just sort of do something, you know, flex their muscles in a different way. Uh, and then you kind of have stars doing things at, at theaters in LA. Now, now Mark Taper Forum is an exception and the Amundsen, which is mostly shows that come in from outside. But um, I don't know. I, I found it very difficult for, to move from the theater things I did for people to see that and translate it in their brains to putting me in front of a camera. Um, now that may have something to do with me. <laughs> I don't know, you know. Um, but I literally, I met with agents who had come to see me in theater, and they happily met with me. And I had people literally say to me, "You are such a good actor. I wish I could help you." Oh no! And uh, and I would go, well, "Well, why?" And they go, "Well, no one else in the office goes to theater, and you you're." X age and you haven't done this and that and it's really really difficult and then and then and that so you know um, I think when you're looking if you're looking at IMDb and you're looking at gaps uh, before Metal Gear it, it's all about that you know it's interesting to hear you say all that because I feel like 
somehow i think i was like i was the film kid in college who was friends with all the theater people uh-huh. um sure. and and somehow it's like all of my theater friends are all east coast or i've noticed it's like kansas city has yeah. like a huge theater sure. um presence and then it, like now it's like i know people who teach like in geneva new york who teach in the theater department sure. at the school there and so it's like sure. i feel like the theater scene seems to be very east coast and i i don't it's yeah. interesting to hear your your take on that well you know, I think if you look, the theater scene is all over. There's a huge theater scene in L.A. Um, you know, it, it, there's a lot going on. The question is, are you getting paid to do it? And, right. uh, and you know, is it something that's going to move a career forward or not? And, and I mean, you know, there's there's tremendous theater in St. Louis. I've worked in St. Louis at the rep there and, uh, uh, you know, all over the country, most, most cities have at least one regional theater presence Mm -hmm. and it's great. Uh, it's fantastic. And it doesn't pay very much to the people who work there, but you, you, you can practice your craft and have a really good time and meet people and you do get paid enough to live. Um, you know, but I mean, LA's, LA's a movie town and LA's, uh, I had a theory, actually, <laughs> I had a theory about LA theater. And my theory is this. Um, I think one of the problems with LA theater, and this could get me into trouble, is that there aren't, there's no central, uh, a really good venue for theater criticism, or at least when I was there, there wasn't. So there was no article you could read somewhere on the web or, or in the times or wherever, where you would get a really good assessment about whether a play was good or not. Um, And what happens is people in LA work really hard and y'all know what the traffic is like. (laughs) And, And you work until six or six thirty at night, and you have to travel somewhere to make an eight o'clock curtain. You don't really have time to eat anything. You spend a lot of effort and sort of traffic anxiety getting there, and then you watch the show. and And if the show isn't good, and and you don't know much about theater, and you read in the Times or somewhere that the show was good, and you get there and you don't really enjoy it, you say to yourself, I must not like theater. Mm. You know, these people are telling me this is good. I don't get it. All this time and energy I took to come and see this show I didn't really enjoy it. I don't understand it. So, so theater's not for me. And then that's it. They're, you know, you've sort of lost theater goers. Um, yeah, I think that makes so sense. So I don't know. That That's, again, I haven't lived in LA in quite a while. So that may have changed. But it um, it is a thing. There, there is uh, there's a, an important role for criticism because... Uh, because of that, you know, we need to know what to make an effort to go see. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you have a, do you have a preference in what you, what you do as far as like, do you prefer doing voice acting or do you prefer on screen or do you prefer motion capture or like the mechanics of theater? Do you prefer that as an example? You know, yeah, no, I, I, I know what you're asking. I mean, I think what I like is being able to to do them all, you know, and the 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 skill required to translate my abilities to each of these different technical mediums. Because really it acting is acting, I think. And um you just have to adjust your uh, you just have to ad- just the way you approach it, depending on how it's being done. Um, you know, there's a really interesting article just recently, uh, interview with Tom Hanks about the new Toy Story movie. And he talks about what it's like to voice act because they, you know, they keep asking him about that. And he, he actually goes in a very, he's amazing, amazingly talented man. Uh, um, but he goes into the, 
the way he approached voice acting as opposed to other kinds of acting and what the difference is and how you have to, you have to adjust your approach. Um, and so that's really true. And so I like being able to do it all is the answer to your question. So in that case, like what led you to Metal Gear? Why Metal Gear? Well, you know, as I say, Metal Gear, I just stumbled onto Metal Gear. I, I stumbled on because Chris Zimmerman called me and said, we're auditioning. And I, I didn't have anything else going on. And it was, they were going <laughs> to, they were going to pay me. Uh, <laughs> so, I, you know, I went in and auditioned and I, and because I had taken her class, I was at least a little bit familiar with what it's like to be in the booth. And, um, I've told this story before, so you all have probably heard it, but I initially auditioned for Snake. Oh, um, yeah. And, and I was, you know, I did my best. Um, can you, and can then, you give us your best and snake? I was about to yeah. leave. I was about to, well. <laughs> you give us your best solid snake. snake. Well, the problem is, I can't, the problem is now that it's just me imitating David Hayes. Right, I, right. I can't remember what <laughs> I was trying to do. Um, uh, and so, but I was about to leave the booth after that audition and Chris said, hold on. And I looked through the glass and there was a little conference going on. And then she, she walked into the booth again with a different script and a different, uh, character. They, they, what they do sometimes is they bring you a picture of the character so you mm. can see what they look like. Uh, and you can try and just use your imagination to base a voice on that picture. So she brought in a picture of Otacon. And uh, at the time, you know, he he kind of had longish hair, which I, my hair was longer than it is now. And he was wearing those, you know, round wire rim glasses, which I wore. And he has kind of a long face. Uh, it sort of, it just looked like me. And I was like, whoa, what is this? So so I read for that and um, and then and got it. So then we went and recorded. But I... It wasn't that I specifically selected Metal Gear. It selected me. Uh, <laughs> what were your how, feelings how you about up... the... Sorry, go ahead. No, you're fine. Go ahead, Alice. Uh, I was just kind of curious like what your feelings were when you were first reading the script. and Because I feel like back then it was pretty unique to begin with. Absolutely. No question. It was totally unique. And, and I think all of us, certainly me, we were all trying to make heads or tails of it. Because, it, you know, first of all, it was like 2000 pages long and they, you know, they kind of didn't really send us the whole script. Of course, now they never send you the whole script. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, and of course all the different options, you know, you have to record, you know, if the, the player decides to go left, you say one thing, if they go right, you say <laughs> another and how that was all written down on the script. It was all very new to me. Um, so, I, you know, I was just kind of winging it, honestly. <laughs> uh, and I think to some degree we all were. I don't know. David Hayter might dispute. But, uh, um, uh, so, David is David. No. <laughs> so, after, um, so, yeah. So, after Go that ahead. very, like, so obviously the story of you recorded in this house with the trucks and everything like that. After, yeah, yeah, did yeah. you expect the series to blow up like it did after you recorded? There's been some people, no. yeah, there's been some people on records, people on record of saying that like David knew, but like I want, I was trying to figure out if anybody else knew that it would become that. Well, um, David was always a, a kind of a gamer himself, mm -hmm. and it's possible that he did know. But of course, no one can ever know. I'm sure it, when he when he says that, and when other people say that, it's the, you know he suspected, mm -hmm. he knew, he knew what the market uh, was, and understood that this was a unique project. And um, <clears throat> I mean, I think I also understood this was a unique project, and if it succeeded it struck me it would be really really cool but i didn't understand the um the extent of the kind of gamer population if you will i didn't realize there were that many people who were really into this kind of thing mm. so i remember we we finished recording and then you know there was 
quite a long time, I don't know, six or eight months or something before the game came out, maybe even longer, because it was already out in Japanese. Uh, so, And that's also maybe why David knew, mm. because he speaks Japanese. <laughs> he lived there. So he probably had a stronger sense of, of how popular it was over there. Um, but I do remember after, you know, at a certain point hearing that it was it was coming out, and I remember... You know, stopping off at at uh, you know the the um, you know magazine stands and finding looking for gamer magazines and looking for a review and um, and I began to find reviews of it and they were just over the top positive. You know, it was like wow. So then I went out and bought a PlayStation and and tried. To- <laughs> So now after all the dust has settled, Metal Gear Solid 5 yeah. came out several years ago. And unfortunately, yeah. since David wasn't cast in the series, you have the yes. most voice credits for the series. Uh, See, now, you know, I you I, I saw that. Uh, I saw that you, you felt that way. But are you taking into account Metal Gear 3, which I am not in? Oh. That's true. Is that why That's it was the true. worst? One? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love three. Uh, um, I, you know, so if you balance those out, I suspect David and I are even. Mm. Uh, I don't. I don't know, um, but certainly, you know, I feel really fortunate that Otacon and then his wonderful father <laughs> Huey. Um, <laughs> Are, are these sort of consistent mainstays in the the story of the game? I, I think that's really cool. You know, that's awesome. Um, I wanted to ask: Is there a reason why you've stuck so close to Metal Gear? Because I think for like I don't know. For I mean, uh, uh, the obvious response would be because they pay, I guess. But <laughs> uh, what what keeps you coming back? Because I mean, it's a long. I mean, from 1998 to 2015, you've yeah. voiced essentially the same character. Yes. Uh, well, you know, obviously I'm doing other things in between and, uh, mm-hmm. and, and I love the series and I love the characters. So, you know, there's no reason to not come back. I, I have, there's no reason for me whatsoever. I, I, you know, and I, and I love the work. I mean, I think, um, you know, it, it, I'm at a real disadvantage for voice acting for games in living in New York City. Uh, almost all of that work is in LA. So, and I have, you know, not all of it, but almost all of it. Uh, um, you know, I I was able to get a thing, as you say, in Red Dead Redemption, and I'm I'm in Mafia Three in smaller parts, and um, and I have friends who live in New York. Who you know, my friend Xanthi Elbrick is the Grand Inquisitor in the Star Wars thing, and uh, you know, so. It can happen, but David and Jennifer and Cam, you know, they live in the in the place where it's all happening. And so, um, you know, they're auditioning, although at, at this level, they don't even have to audition probably. Um, and, and they're there. They're there to do it. You know, no other game is going to fly me to Los Angeles uh, mm-hmm. to record it, sadly. Uh, Metal Gear probably would uh, if they wanted consistency in the character. Um, but yeah, why not go back? It's a cool <laughs> game. It's so amazing. You know, and it, it, it's, it's this kind of Byzantine storyline that just goes on and on and on. And, and Otacon particularly, and I haven't played Otacon in a long time, um, is just a really unique character and and uh, i really like him you know <laughs> how did you feel when for all intents and purposes i guess like the series came to an end yeah that's sad i uh, i'm i'm really sorry about that and um you know i think there are a whole bunch of reasons for that the the you know konami split with mr kojima is part of it and the the his moving on to other things um, and the, I think the move towards, you know, 
games that don't take four years to make. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but I, I just, I don't, I can't imagine there's not a market for another Metal Gear game. Well, there's definitely a market they for it. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, if they wanted to, if they wanted to. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you know, there's, I mean, for years they've been kicking around the whole feature film idea, and I think it's still kicking around. And I would love to see that too. I, it's doubtful that would ever involve me. But, you know, there's so many opportunities for story, you know. Um, so you, 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 I think I might know the answer to this question, but do you prefer Hal what? or Huey? Ah, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, here's the thing. I, I mean, Hal, Hal was first yeah. and, and Hal is wonderful and he is absolutely what I prefer. But, you know, um, playing Huey was really wonderful. Um and it's a wonderful thing to play really morally complicated mm-hmm. characters. Uh, it's it's very exciting, and and any actor will tell you that really. Um, so, and I, you know, I I can't really see Huey coming back necessarily in a, in another game, but but Hal, I, I think there's so many opportunities for Hal. I mean, you could you can put him in all sorts of games you could probably build the game around how i would i would buy we've been on record as we've been on record i think uh sweet baby angel is something we've called how on occasion i think there's there's a lot of we're big fans a lot of con on on this podcast (laughs) well i'm really glad i i'm really yeah no but i mean you know it's funny because uh huey you know, in Peace Walker, Huey is different. Mm. You know, he's not what he is in Metal Gear 5. Um, Agreed. And that was very interesting to me because um, <laughs> because when we were recording 5, I wasn't always completely sure, you know, what side I was on. And they wouldn't tell me always, mm. you know. And as I say, you don't ever get the whole script. so. I, there was I, there was one point, and I wonder if I don't know if Chris remembers it, but I where I said, "Am I a good guy or a bad guy?" And I don't think there was any answer. I think I, I don't think there was any answer, and I think they really it was really actually advantageous yeah. to the performance that I not necessarily know. So there, so so there, so there wasn't like any specific directions. Like we're taking him in a more antagonistic direction, or no, no, not at all. No, um, you know, uh, there there were times where there were a couple things where I would need to know. Um, like if 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 Huey was out and out lying, like I needed to mm-hmm. know that, uh, and so I really I had to sort of. I had to really push Chris and the guys in the booth to get the answer to that. Um, but you know, every character believe every character in any dramatic situation believes that they are doing the right thing, you know, for whatever reason, even, you know, Hannibal Lecter believes that he's <laughs> doing the right thing. Uh, and you, you have to play, you have to play them that way. I mean, all human beings are the heroes in their own, you know, adventure. Um, and, and it's astounding what people will justify, you know, what actions people will justify. So, and you have, you just have to remember that as an actor. I mean, you don't want to play a character as a bad person. Right. Uh, a, 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 an, a, an original rumor that I remember floating around shortly after five came out was that, um, and I can't remember who it was. I think it was like some sort of like friend advisor to Kojima or somebody said something in some Japanese interview that I guess Huey was supposed to play a much bigger role in Metal wow. Gear Solid five originally. I just wanted to ask if you were aware of that or if you recorded things, that- you know, no, I was never aware <laughs> of that. And, um, uh, 
you know, they just, as I say, they don't really tell you, you know, they, right. they, you, they contact you, they ask you if you want to do the character in the project and you say yes. And then they init- give you sort of an initial window of dates for initial recording. And then you just have no idea. Um, you know, it was, it took at least three or four years to record all of that. You know, I mean, and they were trying to work around Kiefer Sutherland's schedule and they were, you know, and it was a very complicated technical thing, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an extraordinary game. Um, I would have loved to have Huey play more of a role. I think I find Huey a fascinating character. Uh, but I prefer Otto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I mean, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and I guess the reason why I was asking was because I wasn't sure, considering that the rumor came from like a, an, an advisor sort of friend, I wasn't sure if that if that was meant to be that Huey had a bigger role on paper before it got started, or if you had a big role and then they decided in post to cut ah, scene. Oh, I see what you're asking. Well, it, it must have been on paper because pretty much everything I recorded wound up mm. in there. Gotcha. Uh, and I, you know, I think I only did four, maybe five sessions. Uh, I mean, you can cover a lot of ground in a session. Um, maybe it was more, it might've been six, but, um, yeah, I, to my memory and I haven't played the game all the way through, but I've watched my 16 year old cousins <laughs> play it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And and I've and I've, you know gone on YouTube and look at the cutscenes. Um, mm-hmm. Pretty much everything that I that I recorded made it in there. That's awesome. <clears throat> um, I wanted to. Sorry, I was clearing my throat. Okay. I apologize. Um, I wanted to ask a question on behalf of one of our listeners, uh, Tori Cortez. Um, she wrote in to the show and asked us to ask you. Yeah. Um, did any of Hal's extremely emotional scenes take a toll on you? How did you handle them, and how do you prepare for Hal's emotional side? And I think I think she means in reference to Metal yeah. Gear Solid Two. I'm sure she does. Yeah. That that. Uh, and the answer is yeah. They it does take a toll. Um, you know you. You get it's uh, it's the same as other acting. Uh, you you get you 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 have to, but it's the same as other acting, except you have to really imagine it all. It all has to be in your head, you know. So the death of one sister, for example, um, is a big deal, and. Um, and so, yes, it, it took a bit of an emotional toll. It certainly took a physical toll. I, I remember having to kind of sob, you know, until Chris Zimmerman told me to stop, which was way longer than I, <laughs> I felt like I wanted to do it. Wow. Um, you know, and, and I have to say, you know, I've seen some Reddit threads where people are like, you know, Otacon's such a baby and how annoying and get out of here with that nonsense cries, you know, he cries at the drop of a hat and all that stuff. So, you know, I, I think that stuff doesn't appeal to everybody, but, um, certainly Hal's, Hal is a very sensitive person and, uh, and he's had a lot of lousy things happen. You know, a lot of people have died in his life and, um, and he's sensitive to that. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, the answer, Tori, is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so to piggyback off that, um, we often talked about on the show how Otacon might be like the most tragic character in the series. Mm. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that playing for him, playing him for so long. Yeah, um, that's interesting. I sort of thought about it like that but but you're probably right at least uh, on paper um he has had the most you know terrible things happen to him Uh, for me what's been cool about playing him over such a long period of time is that i think in the writing uh, he's grown you know you you know he started out really really young and and with a kind of an innocence um 
And I think as you look at him over the course of the series, he's, he's, you know, he's grown from experience and, you know, the way we all do. I mean, if if you're around long enough in life, you're going to get knocked around a bit and you, you kind of take that and, and you find some wisdom from that. I think if you're, if you're lucky and you're smart, um, so, and I, I think what makes Hal increasingly interesting is all these things that happen to him over the course of the series. And uh, at this point, he's, I think he probably ha- has a wisdom along with all the wounds that he's carrying. Yeah, and I think that probably also contributed um, due to like his relationship with Snake and like the bromance <laughs> that they had. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, how, do you, well, how do you feel about like that transition from, you know, Snake meeting Otacon in a locker, peeing himself to being like the most hardcore bromance in maybe video game history? Yeah, I think it probably is. And, and <laughs> I think it's I think it's really cool. And and uh, um, <laughs> particularly at the end of, uh, of Metal Gear One, you know, if, if you played it right and we get to ride off on a snowmobile <laughs> together, there's always a little something going on there that was questionable. <laughs> um, but, but, I always you know, killed Meryl so I could ride off with Otacon. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's out there now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think it's, a, I think it's an a, a amazing, um, relationship it's an amazing buddy relationship that's very unusual and uh and they both really care for each other and i mean i think and you guys can correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think there's anybody who really cares for snake in that way other than Mm. otacon You know, I've never so, thought of it like that. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I, I don't think Snake has anyone who who sort of emotionally understands him and is connected to him. Mm. Yeah. Um, at least wow. no so character that is still, still alive in the mm. series, you know. Um, so I think that's cool. And I, I just, again, you know, I think there's a lot to build on there. You could just go on and on and on with these stories. So... Um, uh, it would be fun to see another game. Well, well, <laughs> yeah, I want to see what happens. Yeah, that's. Sonny's I was gonna dad. say. Yeah, 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 what do you is. What do you think? What do you think they went off to do <laughs> after four ended? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, good question. I um have no answer there. <laughs> it's up to the imagination. Um, when you were recording so so we've talked a little bit about like the evolution of the 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 process of recording um we've talked to a couple yeah. of people and it seems like the original was recorded um in like such a short amount of time whereas four took um about 9 months to do and i don't know if you can correct us on that or not but would was that is that because the scripts got bigger and a little bit more complex or is it because the process changed or what was it like jumping like scaling up like that uh you know i mean i don't remember how long it took to do two and of course i really only know you know the parts that i had to go and do um there's a lot of otacon in two um because there's all those codec calls uh, I think, you know, I think it was an upscaling of the technological process and, and I think the scripts got longer, you know, as the, as the cut scenes got sort of more involved, um, four was, you know, almost over the top in terms of long cut scenes. And, uh, um, so I just think, I think the success of the first one, uh, Mr. Kojima really just wanted to run with it. And, and he and his team and their imaginations really I think were like, how far can we take this? Um, and because it had been such a success, I think they were allowed more time and probably a bigger budget uh, to, to do the successive ones. 
So that, that would be my guess mm -hmm. anyway. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, Christopher, uh, were there, just given how we asked David, uh, <laughs> given his experience with screenwriting, uh, yeah. what his thoughts were on the scripts. And he gave a very like political answer or very yeah. like a uh, non-political answer where he was like, well, I wouldn't write them like that. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you, were there any lines while you were reading that you just found to be really funny mm -hmm. or that tripped <laughs> you up? You know, I'm sure there were, uh, I honestly don't remember them. Okay. You know, a, a lot of what Otacon was doing, particularly early on, was kind of doing the technical specs of the weaponry and, uh, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that sometimes was really hard to just put in my mouth. Um, the storylines uh were i don't know yeah sometimes they were they were a little out there um <laughs> uh you know you and, that, yeah. and i mean the you kind of got to you kind of had to put your head into the world that was there so like you know the awkward love scene <laughs> how to do you know that was it was you know there there's a touch of goofy um, which I didn't sort of didn't mind, um, because it's kind of part of the sensibility. Uh, I'm certain that David's right, that he would not have written <laughs> that way. <laughs> How did um, you feel about all of Otacon's love interest throughout the series? Cause he's uh, had some, uh, interesting ones. You know, my heart, my heart is always with Sniper Wolf. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Me too. I bet, and I, and I think it's you know it's partly just because of because of Tasia Flynn's performance, but it's also <laughs> just, um uh I don't know it just that that whole scene uh, you know in the snow with the howling wolves in the background. And it was something really kind of magical about that. And, and, yeah. uh, you know, Otacon kneeling by her body and, and, you know, yelling at snake, what are we fighting for? You know, all of that <laughs> is, I just thought that was great. So, so yeah, um, I, she, she's number one in, in my mind. Um, but you know, none of them went very well for Otacon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Except for Snake, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know what you mean, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I imagine that moment with with Wolf in the snowfield is probably up there. But in a similar vein, do you have any other um, favorite moments or um, any from recording or any quotes that you really love from Otacon or Huey that that you re remember fondly? Well, sure. Um, certainly that that scene is is a favorite. Um, I think the I'm trying to remember now that I think the end of four, you know, was pretty amazing mm. where snake old snake is dying and, and Otacon is kind of trying to um, talk to Sonny, you know, that's kind of a, a very powerful scene. And, and I, I always like the humor um, mm. that Otacon brought, you know, as goofy as it was sometimes. Um, so, you know, some of those, some of the kind of weird Chinese proverbs with Mei Ling and all of that uh, was, <laughs> and I don't know if they really hold up now, but at the time it, that was really, really fun and, and fun to play um, for sure. And as to Huey, uh, I don't know. I think I think his ambivalence. Uh, well, that's not the right word, is it? Um, you know, his trial scene was pretty extraordinary, yeah. uh, and 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 where he, you know, getting lowered on the boat and and all of that was that was that was pretty powerful stuff um, because because you're playing. I mean, at that point, you're kind of playing a guy who really knows he's made some mistakes, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but is also 
I think he's also, you know, not wrong in the things that he's yelling at Snake yeah. and and that team. Um, yeah, I I think like Peace Walker is probably on record as like one of my favorite games in the series. Uh-huh. And I really, I and particularly because of the characters, I yeah. think of all of the sort of like, and I don't know, it's not really like a side game, but of all of the sort of like spin y kind of games that most people haven't played, it's yeah. it's got so much meat to it. Yeah. And so for me to see Huey kind of become what he became in five, I yeah. was just like thoroughly bummed out. Yeah. Well, you're not alone. I, I mean, a, a lot of people, a lot of people were, and, and there were a couple of interviews I did right after five came out and, and, you know, it was it was almost instant. Like, what is up with Huey? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he really did change from. Uh, and I it I don't know this for sure, but it but I'm assuming that the kind of concept of who he was changed between Peace Walker and Five. Um, I mean, meaning. Kojima's concept of who he was and where he fit into the into the sort of overall storyline right um, what's the um I'm, I'm always curious just because like i guess on paper it's like hal and huey look very similar they have mm-hmm. a very similar way of talking yeah um from like an acting perspective though i mean did you have a, a different process to kind of become hal versus getting in the mindset to be Huey uh, and was, was that different between Peace Walker and five? Yeah, no, we did have to, I mean, we did have to find a different approach, but, um, you know, and they've, I don't know Hal. Uh, at least initially Hal had a higher pitched voice, mm-hmm. um, than, than what you're hearing me speak as now. Mm-hmm. And, and as he got older, it began to drop a little bit. Um, with Huey, I think we, and we talked about it, Chris and I talked about it a little bit before we even started with him. I think the idea was really, he was just much more my normal voice. Um, and that the, the, really the difference in the characters was less about the sound of the voice than just the, you know, just the personality, the attitude uh, uh, and personality of them. And that for me really came mostly out of the writing. You know, you, it's really funny because, because you, because there's such a huge space between doing these characters, you know, sometimes there's like two years uh, and then they call you and they want to hear Otacon, they want you to do Otacon again. And I remember when I went back to do two, or maybe even when it was going, because it was even longer until we did four, I I didn't know if I still knew how to do Otacon. Oh, wow. Oh, no. And they... You know, they what what they would do was play they, they would play some old tapes of him and and I just run through a few lines and and it would just it just would come right back. And Chris would go, There he is, that's there he is. And it it's less about the tone uh, the the pitch of the voice or any manipulation I'm doing than it is uh just a kind of attitude it's the otacon attitude towards life (laughs) (laughs) i love that that's amazing um so christopher we are uh we are now uh at our sort of time and we we want to be respectful of your time so we're gonna kind of get to the to the end of the road here but we always want to ask all of our guests um kind of uh not only what they've got upcoming and stuff like that but we we love to ask everybody kind of what they do for fun um Ah, so, what do I? Yeah, do? we were curious. Uh, do you have any hobbies or anything? Well, you know, if you were to look on my Instagram page, uh, which you're all welcome to do, <laughs> um, you would see about thirty pictures of pies, yes, uh, and and a whole bunch of loaves of bread. So what? I love to cook, and uh, and I'm I'm constantly, you know, baking. Usually in the summer, I'm making pies a lot, less so in the winter. And, um, I, so I, I love to cook and it. And when I come visit my parents, I'm kind of the family cook. So I'll be cooking dinner pretty much as soon as we start yeah. talking. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so I really enjoy, I enjoy that. And I, uh, I enjoy being outside, you know, um, I, I grew up, 
I'm I'm here in this house and uh, and we're on Cape Cod actually or near Cape Cod. We're right on the water, and I grew up, you know, spending summers here and swimming and sailing and uh, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, I really enjoy that. Um, and of course, you know, I go to the theater a lot and uh, I read and um, what else? Bake pie. Hey, you're an amazing, you're an amazing <laughs> human being. Chris. What's Thank your favorite you. kind of pie yes. to make? Ah, great question. Well, um, I think I would say that my most uh, my the most requested pie uh, among friends and family is is yes. blueberry. That's actually yeah. in your in your I, Twitter I have, bio, I believe. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Yes, it is. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, so, so for sure. But you know, I always enjoy, and I haven't done it yet because it's been so cold and rainy. But um, usually, in the, you know, beginning of the summer, I usually make a strawberry rhubarb, yes. and I really enjoy it. That's cool. awesome. Yeah, that's my that's my wife's favorite pie. Ah, uh, yeah. There we go. Well. So that that would be my answer to that. Very cool. <laughs> nice. Um, Christopher, do you have um, do you have any anything upcoming that you're allowed to tell us about, or anything you would like our listeners to know? Where to find you? Um, all kinds of that. Anything like that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I I don't have any real upcoming projects at the moment. I, I there's a bunch of things in the works. It's mostly theater, um, which, you know, if you're in the New York area, you can um, just keep an eye out. Um, certainly, I'll be there. You know, you can uh, find find me on my Twitter, which is Christofran, at Christofran. Um, and anything that's going on would get posted there. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm working on a there, there's some writers I'm working with who have a number of scripts going on and I'm trying to get in there and audition. I really, uh, this year, um, I'm really trying to make a push towards film and television. There's so much that is shooting in New York city. So, uh, if I can get myself on one of those shows, it'll be on my Twitter feed for sure. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Please watch. <laughs> Very cool. Um, Sam, do you want to do you want to tell Chris yes, about our yes, yes, yes. Okay, so since okay. episode one of this podcast, we've done about not not including the interview episodes we've done, we've done about one hundred and twenty four episodes of the show, and wow, good. and um, ever since episode one, our outro um, in the original Metal Gear Solid game, um, when a guard spots Snake in a box, um, and they mm-hmm. they dismiss it. They go, it's just a box. So our gag has been that we try and meander our way to saying it's just a box to close out the show. And we were wondering if um, if we could have Otacon do that for us on this instance. Sure, sure, uh, no question. Um, <laughs> do you have any context for that, or you just say? You I, just I think I, well, I, well, we we kind of invent the context, and apparently people think it's oh, funny. Okay. So we, you know, it's whatever, whatever you feel like doing, <laughs> we're okay with. Well, I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, uh, it's funny actually because I'm I'm at my parents' house, and my my dear mother has actually bought a bunch of new summer furniture and um so there are a whole bunch of boxes (laughs) lying around the house Um, and uh uh i think if uh if otacon were to uh sneak downstairs at night for a, a snack he might uh i don't know he might see something in the shadows and uh and be scared and say something like, uh, snake, what's that? Oh, oh, don't worry. It's just a box. Just a box. 